Hello everybody and welcome to my webinar on, on validation. Now I see I've got quite a few of you online now. Um, you can obviously listen via your computer if you wish or you can dial in to the telephone number provided and hear the audio by the telephone, whichever works best for you. I mute all of your phones, all of your audio. Uh, with so many people online, it, uh, it will become very difficult for everybody if uh, you all try and talk, talk at once, so I'm afraid I've muted you. Um, do not use the raised hand feature. Please, uh, if you've got any questions, type them into the chat box, and I will respond to as many of these as possible at the end of my presentation. So a little bit about me to introduce myself. Um, I'm an analytical chemist. I describe myself these days as a former analytical chemist. So I've not actually worked in the lab for over 30 years. Um, I spent 30 years with Eli Lilly. Um, I've been a qualified person since 1985. And one of the many uh, extracurricular activities I got up to, I was uh, Lilly's representative on the FPA Manufacturing and GMP Committee. And through that, I got involved with ICH. I was at the workshop where the idea of Q8, Q9, and Q10 was devised, and I became the FPA leader on the ICH Q9 expert working group that wrote the standard on quality risk management, which obviously is a, an important component within validation. And for the last 13 years, I've been within, with NSF Health Sciences. So my objectives uh, for this webinar are to help you understand the origins of the new, and note I put the new in inverted commas, uh, science and risk-based approach to validation. What is different compared for this approach compared to the traditional approach, and highlight some of the similarities and differences between EU and US guidance on validation. So a bit of terminology. I'm going to use validation as an umbrella term to include everything qualification, process validation, et cetera, anything that might impact quality. Qualification is a term I'm going to reserve for facilities, equipment, utilities, systems, et cetera. And process validation is about the process you use to, promote, to produce commercial products. So um, typically I'll talk about qualifying facilities and equipment, and you process validate your, your manufacturing processes. So in the pharmaceutical industry, what do we validate? Well, at times it seems like everything. Um, obviously, we validate our manufacturing processes for both the active ingredients and the product itself. We will qualify our facilities and equipment, the HVAC, the water, steam, gases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, any automated systems, any computer systems. We validate our analytical methods and equipment, and we validate our cleaning methods. So we do a lot of validation in the pharmaceutical industry. However, for this webinar, I'm going to focus on qualification for equipment, facilities, and utilities, and process validation. And as we'll see, the reason I'm putting those two together is because as far as the FDA is concerned, they're all part of process validation. But remember, before embarking on any of these activities, you must have already validated all of your test equipment, be calibrated and qualified, and the test methods themselves must be validated. Otherwise, uh, you end up with a castle built on sand. So the prerequisite is to have all of your testing equipment calibrated, all your processing equipment um, is, is, has got to be qualified, and we'll talk about that. And the test analytical methods would be validated if it's a lab method to ICHQ2. So here's the definition from ICHQ7 of validation. And I guess some key words here are documented. We have to share these things with regulators and internally. Provide a high degree of assurance, but nothing in this life is ever guaranteed 100%, um, that the specific process or method or system will. And the key word here is consistently produce a result meeting predetermined acceptance criteria. So consistency is the aim of validation. Now, I said the new was in inverted commas because, frankly, the science and risk-based approach really here in 2018 should not be new to you. It started with the publication of ICH Q8 and 9 in November 2005, 
and I was, as I say, had the privilege of being part of the drafting group for Q9, although we worked very closely as well with Q8. Continued by Q10, Q11, and now we have a draft of Q12. And we've had numerous guidances from the EMA and the FDA, um, the FDA in 2011. So none of this is actually that new. But unfortunately, from what I've seen as I go around in, in my consultancy role, is still very few people actually taking advantage of, of this new approach and, uh, uh, and actually managing their validation uh, in that way. So this is a, t a timeline, if you like, um, of where we are. Started really with the FDA talking about PAT, Process Analytical Technology. That led to um, the ideas in Q8, Q9, and Q10, which were drive well, Q, Q9 and Q8 came out in 2005. Q10 followed a little bit later. Then we got the FDA guidance on process validation in 2011. 2012, we got ICH Q11, which is effectively ICH Q8 for APIs. Then we got started to get EMA guidance on process validation in 2014, on Annex 15 revision in 2015, and we've got more guidance still going on, and the Q12 is still being drafted. So it's a journey, and it's been over, what, now nearly 14 years, so it really isn't that new. So we, this is the applicable guidance, and I'm going to be talking about all of these. Uh, to some extent, but mainly I'm going to be looking at probably the FDA and the European guidance. It does all link. It all tells a continuous story. It's about changing the approach to validation from a one-time event just before you submit a marketing authorized application to something that occurs throughout the product life cycle so that you're looking at, first of all, deciding what your product wants to do, then your quality attributes, your critical process parameters, and your material quality attributes. It all links together across the product life cycle. So the main guidances we have um, from the regulators are the FDA guidance on process validation, which came out in January 2011. That was followed later by EMA guidance on process validation for finished products and for bio uh, manufacture of active substances. And we've had the revision of uh, Annex 15 uh, in 2015. So it's all about linking it together, linking IC, start with an ICH Q8. It's about, first of all, deciding what do you want the product to do. That then will give you critical quality attributes of the product. In other words, the product must have this property, otherwise it will not be work or may potentially harm patients. You then have to design a process to deliver that product with those critical quality attributes. And you will, as you design that process, come up with critical manufacturing attributes, uh, material attributes, sorry, of the input materials and critical process parameters uh, that support the CQAs. You may or may not dis decide to um, define a design space. That is optional. Ultimately, though, what your goal is is to have that process and a control strategy that will ensure you produce a consistent product. So Q10 helps here because that's all about the quality system that helps you achieve the realization of that product and maintain the state of control. You, as part of your development work, will come up with your control strategy, but that needs to be continuously applied throughout the commercial life of that product, which may be 10 or more years. And uh, also, an idea that was new to pharmaceuticals, but not to other industries in Q10, was the idea of facilitating continual improvement, that you don't fix the process at the time you, you start to market it, but you have the ability to make improvements as you gain more knowledge about the product and the process. So all that fits together across the, the life cycle of the product, um, right the way through from the quality target product profile through to continual improvement. That's all based on science, your quality system, your quality risk management, your knowledge management, and you have the enablers at the bottom in yellow. Process analyzers, if you've got inline or online uh, analysis, that helps. Uh, designed experiments and the multivariate statistical analysis to uh, understand what those are telling you, and maybe you even go as far as modeling your process. 
Now, unfortunately, the terminology in the EU and the US is not always consistently uh, applied. It's not always the same. The US call the whole process that I've just been talking about from end to end process validation, and they split it into three distinct stages. The EU is a little more muddled in its thinking. It, for process design, it simply talks about, uh, really refers you to ICHQ8, um, and it really the valid that what you call validation or process validation is focused on stages two and three of the FDA guidance. And on stage three, there is a further uh, uh, confusion. The FDA unfortunately used the word continued process validation. With uh, Europe calls it ongoing process validation, which is. Frankly, I wish the FDA had adopted that term as well. The first sentence in stage three of their guidance says, by a continued process verification, we mean ongoing. And I just wish they'd called it ongoing. It, as we'll see in a minute, it, it can cause confusion. So really the FDA came out with their guidance uh, first in 2011, and it is a very, very well-written piece of guidance. It is completely logical and it really emphasizes that everything you do is based on your product and process understanding, and that has to be based on science and risk. So it took a completely different view that the whole end-to-end -end process was called process validation. It starts with product and process development, which is why Q8 is so relevant. It justifies commercial processing and release, obviously using um, Q9 to, for your risk assessment, and then once you get into the commercial phase and lock everything down, you need Q10 to make sure it can stays there. As I say, unfortunately, they came up with this phrase, continued process verification, to be applied during the commercial phase. So uh, the approach is, first and foremost, you need to establish your product and process understanding. So you need to establish a strategy for process control. You need to understand the sources of variation. Uh, they can come from uh, material inputs. They can come from your equipment. They can come from your operators. You're always going to have variation. So process control is all about understanding and controlling variation. You need to have techniques for detecting variation and measuring it. You need to understand which of the variables actually have an impact on your product. There may be a whole series of variables there, but actually they don't have any impact on the critical quality attributes of your product, and therefore um, you don't need to worry about them. On the other hand, others may be critical, so they will become critical process parameters, and they're the things you need to control. And your control strategy needs to be based around that knowledge of which of your variables are important, how are they important, and what is your control strategy for them. So the FDA has these three distinct stages, process design. Then you have the stage that everybody historically has thought about as process validation, what the Americans call process qualification, basically confirming that whatever you've designed as a process to make your product is capable of consistently making a product during commercial manufacturing. But then in stage three, you're not done. You have to continually monitor to make sure that it remains in a state of control. Now, this is the diagram that FDA used to explain their process, and you can see how it links together. They actually split stage two into two subparts. First of all, is about qualification, design and qualification of the equipment and the facilities. And then the second part, and that is the part that we historically we thought of as process validation, is what they call process performance qualification. If that's successful, you put that all in your marketing authorization application and obviously get uh, uh, authority to distribute your product. But the continued process verification allows you to monitor the process, and you may well have to make changes, in which case you have to go back around the loop uh, and obviously probably make a, a variation to your marketing authorization uh, to accommodate that. But the point is you're never done with process validation as far as the American is concerned. It is an ongoing activity throughout the life cycle. Process design, as I said, is really all about what's 
ICH Q8 for products or Q11 for the active substances uh, is about understanding the sources of variation, detect the presence and degree of variation, understand the impact, and then control it. You then obviously have to qualify the facility and the equipment that you're going to use to make the uh, product. That needs to be done before you move on to the next stage. Obviously, when you're designing a facility, you need to make sure you select the appropriate utilities and equipment. You're going to have to verify the installation versus your design spec and then verify that they're operating uh, as anticipated within the operating range. So it does what you expect it to do. Historically, that's been done using the V model, and that's really what is built into Annex 15 of the EU GMPs. Other ways of doing it have been put forward. Um, mainly, they've been adopted in the US, but a lot of it is still uses the V model approach. The next stage, as I say, historically, this is what people have thought of as being process validation, is qualification of the process. Is the process capable of consistently producing product? And obviously, you've qualified your equipment. You've got your data from your pilot studies, all of your development work. You've got to now start making it probably at commercial scale, which you may not have done before. And really, the work you do here confirms that the process you've designed is capable of producing product that will meet the, the needs of patients and on a consistent basis. The FDA in this stage drop the three batches. They do not mention any number of batches that you need to make in order to achieve this state of control. It merely says you should uh, draw a conclusion and the release of lots to market should be based on the entire compilation of knowledge and information gained from the design, design stage through the process qualification stage. So as far as the FDA is concerned, they make no mention of the number of batches. How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to be looking at things like control charts to decide whether you're in control. You're going to be looking at your risk assessments uh, and your control strategies coming out of those risk assessments, and you'll want to know your process capability. What is the capability of the process? I certainly know, you know a lot of companies will, say, shoot for a CPK of 1.67 uh, in the development arena with a view that they're probably going to get more variability in the commercial, but really are aiming for a CPK of at least 1.33 in, in commercial. Having finally decided, and obviously you have to put all that into a marketing authorization, and that ultimately is reviewed and hopefully approved by the regulatory authorities, um, you get to commercialize the product. But the FDA's view was, well, you're not done. You've got to have an ongoing program to collect and analyze data, a system for detecting unplanned departures from the process, and feedback loops, if necessary, to make improvements, and uh, if necessary, as I say, change the process in light of new data. Because the reality is, um, you've made very few batches. If it's a new chemical entity, you will have made very few batches at commercial scale, probably before you actually start commercializing the product. And so you're bound to find new variations and uh, new sources of material variation, equipment variation over time as you go through commercial manufacturers. So you need to be continually learning about your product and your process. The EMA came up with guidance. Um, the CHMP first issued guidance in 2014, and that had a minor revision in 2016. They had biotech guidance um, on for active substances in 2016. And we have EU GMP Annex 15, which came out uh, in 2015, October 2015. So the EMA guidance starts off by using very similar words to the FDA guidance that endorses the life cycle approach. Process validation should not be viewed as a one-off event. It is a life cycle approach should be applied. So that seems to be consistent with the FDA, although it's not quite so split into the three stages that the FDA does. The link between product and process development validation is all about maintenance of a state of control, and the process validation should confirm that the control strategy 
supports the process design and the product quality. Now, here's where we start to get into some confusion. The FDA used this term continued process verification for stage three. Unfortunately, that's not the terminology that was used in ICHQ8. The Europeans correctly use the terminology in ICHQ8. They talk about the traditional approach and the continuous, O-U-S on the end, process verification approaches. And continuous process verification in the EU guidance is not the same as the continued process verification in the FDA guidance, which has caused a lot of confusion for many people, particularly as in some European languages, you simply cannot distinguish between the two. So the traditional approach is fine, it's what we've always done. The continuous process validation approach is where you are constantly monitoring your process using usually sort of PA tool tools and techniques, either online or at line, in line um, measurement, so that you are literally continuously monitoring it and you make your release decisions and your control strategy is based on that continuous monitoring. What uh, is now being called real-time release is, is one consequence of that as a possibility. The European guidance also says you can have a hybrid strategy, which is a mixture of traditional and continuous. In other words, you might do traditional for some stages of the manufacturer, whereas in others you might do continuous processing. So for instance, maybe a blending and, and drying producing as a granule for a tablet product, you might use PA tool, TAT tools and techniques to monitor the blending and monitor the drying. But by the time you get to compression, you're back to a more traditional approach um, using all the normal controls of weight and hardness and thickness and friability, et cetera, uh, on the compression machine. So you can have a hybrid approach across the manufacturing process. So the traditional approach in the European guidance is largely unchanged. It says you can base your validation on pilot scale batches, although they must be at least 10% of the full scale and for biologics, they must be at full scale. And it says all the right things, that it, you should base your decision on the variability of the process, the complexity of the process, the process knowledge gained through development and supportive data at commercial scale and the overall experience, which is pretty much the same wording as in the FDA guidance. Unfortunately, it then goes on to say, well, data on a minimum of three is probably what you need. So as far as Europe's concerned, the magic three is not yet dead. And I, for one, was disappointed to see that, that um, it really kind of misses the point. It says, well, you need to decide how many, and then but three is probably the number, which I would disagree with. If you know anything about statistics, probably the minimum number ought to be five. So EU talked about continuous process verification, which is the phrase used in ICHQ8, and it is where you are basing your monitoring, you're continuously monitoring your manufacturing during the manufacture rather than relying on end testing, and it's uh, applicable to both traditional and enhanced product development, but it does obviously require extensive inline, outline, or online monitoring or con and controls. Now, for the stage three that the Americans called continued process verification, the EMA guidance calls it ongoing process verification. So it is directly analogous to stage three of the American guidance. And it talks about that you need to use the right statistical tools. And typically, you're talking about needing to have control charts to ensure you're maintaining a state of control and monitor your process capability to make sure that you are maintaining the capability from what it was when you originally submitted. So in terms of the guidance, uh, both FDA and, and the EMA guidance do support the principles that are laid down in Q8, Q9, Q10, and Q11. The key fundamentals are taking a science and risk-based approach across the life cycle. But everything you do is based on that product and process understanding. And that's where knowledge management comes in that's mentioned in Q10. Because all too often, the people in development have all the knowledge and they don't pass that on to the people in operations. Uh, and that you know, clearly isn't going to work. Because it's all about control of the commercial manufacturing process and understanding the, the variation on an ongoing basis. There are some differences between the EMA and the FDA. Um, 
the focus difference differs. The PV guidance in Annex 15 is very much manufacturing focus. It doesn't join it up in the same way the FDA guide does. So personally, I, I think the FDA guidance is better written. I think the EMA is a lot more fragmented and can be confusing for people. And as I said, it isn't really new. It's, the whole concept was laid down originally in, in Q8 and, and built on the Q9, how you do it, and Q10. And that's been around for well over 10 years now. So it's all about identifying the process variables, coming up with a control strategy. Then you qualify that manufacturing or validate the manufacturing process. You monitor it continually uh, in an ongoing way. And if necessary, go right back around the loop to improve as you get more information. If you need more detail on this, um, we do run, a, we're running in next month, uh, almost exactly a month away now, a three-day course where we will talk about in detail how you actually achieve each of these stages. So that's a three-day course in Manchester in the UK, and we can also deliver it in-house. If you're interested in the statistical tools and techniques that you're going to use for ongoing process verification, I'll be talking about those uh, at a statistical process control two-day course in September. And we'll look at how you visualize your data, control charts, process capability, and linear regression, which is a technique you use to monitor your stability, because that's the other thing that doesn't need to change with time, is the stability of the product. All of those things go into your uh, ongoing process verification. Um, if there's any new developments in this thing, please download our app, the NSF Pharma app, which is available for Apple and Android uh, operating system phones and tablets. And uh, all the legislation and guidance I've been talking about is there. Uh, and any new developments uh, we will put there as well. And uh, that's on an ongoing basis. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I've got one question so far being put up there. What's the difference between um, PV, process validation, and PPQ? The answer is it's simply uh, terminology. The Americans in stage 2.2, they call it process performance qualification. Historically, that's been what we've thought of as process validation, the thing you do immediately before you submit your marketing authorization application. Historically, that's been make three batches and test them to death. Um, the Americans have used the term process validation to cover the whole life cycle, right the way through from development through the commercial manufacturer, the ongoing um, process verification. So the Americans use the term process validation to cover the whole life cycle. Europe's a little bit more confusing. It, tends, it says in the guidance in NX15 that by process validation they do mean the whole life cycle approach, but actually everything they write really says that the, they're talking about that stage that the Americans call process performance qualification. So the terminology can be a little confusing. Um, somebody asked uh, me uh, where can you download this presentation. It, the presentation is being recorded. I am recording it. So. Uh, what will happen is, and maybe take about a week, um, it goes to some people that do some work, some clever stuff, and um, we will send you a link where you can actually download from our website the whole of the recording so that you'll have the slides with my commentary built in. Okay, um, somebody's asking about how is this topic taken by other health authorities in the um, Russia, Brazil, um, and so on. And the answer is, uh, it's, a, it's a journey. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's not um, taken off so much, is that some of the other health authorities who are less developed in their thinking in these areas struggle, frankly, with some of the concepts. However, um, they have been around for 10 years now. A lot of these countries are now joining ICH, so are signing up to the, the more advanced approach to some of these things. So it, we are all hopeful that over time, this approach that's certainly definitely accepted in Europe and the US will be more widely ex accepted around the world. But uh, that's one of the reasons why it is taking so long to actually be implemented. So thank you all for listening. Um, that's the half an hour up. So thank you for attending and for your questions and answers. Um, I'll be 
be in touch and we'll let you know when you can download the recording from the website. So thank you everybody for, for attending today. It's been a pleasure. I hope you found it useful.